Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today, as promised, we're back looking at these things on the RF machine, beam expanders. I apologise if I'm going to cover some old ground for people that have been following the series, but many people just jump in and out of these videos at random. And what I'm going to talk about today will have no sense at all unless I go into a little teeny weeny bit of background. And even those people that are old timers, so to speak, may not fully appreciate why I'm so desperate to get this machine working in the way that I think it could possibly work. Now you have to regard a laser beam as being something like a mountain. It's a mountain of intensity, where at the edge of the beam there is very little intensity. In other words, the light is dim. But right at the centre of the laser beam, the light is very, very bright, i.e. the intensity is high. And these three zones here very roughly give you an idea of the proportions of the power that's used for each one of these sections. So one, two, three, four, five, six millimetre wide beam. Now the central two millimetres of the beam, this bit here, contains about 70% of the power. So in a 100 watt tube, you've got 70 watts being used in this particular area. And then you've got about another 10 watts in this blue zone here. So 70, 10, 10 is 90. That leaves us five and five for these outer zones. So that approximately is the power distribution within a laser beam. And all laser beams, whatever sort of laser beams they are, they will all have this very particular shape called a Gaussian distribution. And that's the way in which the intensity, the light intensity, is distributed across the beam. Now, as you can see, the beam has no real edge to it. This might look like an edge, but it disappears away out here to nothing. It feathers to nothing. So it's impossible to say where the edge of a laser beam is. But we do know where the centre is. That's the point of maximum power. A laser beam should ideally be this shape. Now, this shape is a mathematically defined shape. It has two properties. Number one, the area under this graph represents the watts. And the height of the graph represents the intensity of the light in the graph. This area is a very important feature of a laser beam. This is the glass tube on my other machine, and it's a 70 watt tube. So when I run it at say 10 watts, and these are just nominal numbers, then it will have a distribution which you will recognize as this distribution here, a Gaussian distribution. Now, when I push the power up to 70 watts from 10 watts, it still is a Gaussian distribution. The formula for this graph remains exactly the same as this one. The, the beam diameter doesn't change just because I wind the power up and down. But what does change is the intensity at the centre of the beam. The intensity at the edge of the beam doesn't change at all. It's still virtually zero. So it's a bit like putting water in a balloon. You know, you can squeeze the balloon as much as you like, and all that will happen is it will change its shape. It won't change the volume of water in the, in the balloon itself. The same applies here. You know, this volume under here, this area under here, represents watts. This little area here represents 10 watts, and this big area here represents 70 watts. Okay, so there's seven times as much area in this shape as there is in this shape. As I change the power, I'm not changing the baseline, so I'm actually changing the shape of the graph and making it more pointed or sharper. When I wind my glass tube machine up to 70 watts and without any lens in, I burn into acrylic, here's what happens in 10 seconds. You can see the diameter of the beam. It's probably as I specify on here, about eight millimetres diameter, and it goes in about 25 millimetres deep in 10 seconds. Now, if I compare that one, which is my 70 watt glass tube, with this one, which is this machine here, look, it's got about a three millimetre diameter beam. And instead of taking 10 seconds to burn 25 millimetres deep, 
This one did it in about three seconds. So the point that I'm really making here is if we can keep this beam small, even though it's only 35 watts as opposed to 70 watts, can actually burn faster and deeper than a 70 watt tube. Purely because the beam is very small in diameter and the energy concentration is high in the center of the beam, very high. And the higher the intensity, the faster we can do damage. The prize for getting this beam all around this machine, this size, is enormous. The problem is the beam on this machine will expand from this to this between the two extremes of the machine. Laser beams are not parallel anyway, but on the glass tube they expand at the rate of about three millimeters per meter. On the RF tube they expand at the rate of about seven millimeters per meter. So this is a disaster going from here to here at extreme edges of the machine. Let's try and make sense of those bits of acrylic with a couple of diagrams. The area under this Gaussian distribution here is equivalent to 10 watts. So let's call that area A equals 10 watts. So 70 watts is 7A, 7 times the area. And so therefore when we come to a 35 watt beam this area in here is 3.5A. But look at the diameter of the beam. So the diameter of the beam is half the diameter of this one which means we've got to squash 3.5A into that area. And look what it does. It makes that 35 watt beam more powerful than a 70 watt beam as far as cutting intensity is concerned. And that's why this is such a tempting prize to aim for. To be able to make a 35 watt RF beam more powerful than a 70 watt glass beam. I mean, that's unheard of. So this is a 35 watt RF beam, nice and sharp, straight out the tube. What do the big boys do that sell these very, very expensive machine? Well, I call them engraving machines because they're certainly not cutting machines because they take this lovely beam and they do what physics tells them they should do, which is to put it into a beam expander. And beam expander is exactly what it says. It takes this beam and it's times three or times four and they turn it into this shape. So look, we've already compromised the potential 80 watts of cutting power down to 25 watts of cutting power. And this is a 35 watt RF beam, remember. Supposedly, that should give me a parallel beam. The same quality of whatever this is all around the machine. Two questions I have to ask myself <clears throat> on the basis of what I've found so far about the science of light and these machines. Do I believe that? Well, today we're going to find out a little bit more about it because <clears throat> I'm going to do some more experiments to see if we can get somewhere close to this. I, I try and find out what the problem is. Where am I losing the sharpness? Is it because I'm expanding the beam? Is it because of distance? Technically, it shouldn't be because of distance. Well, if we move the clamp screw from there, we can slide this whole thing out like this because it's fixed at the other end. Take my mirror off. An RF unit that delivers supposedly 30 watts. In reality, it's delivering almost 38 watts. We're gonna fire this beam into a block of acrylic. I'll have to blow air onto it because it will catch fire otherwise. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. And that's how far the beam penetrates in five seconds. We're now going to add a times two expander into the system. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Massive loss of intensity. The Gaussian distribution has obviously been disrupted. So the block is now 500 millimeters beyond the beam expander. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's 
five seconds. All the central intensity has disappeared. Now here's the one times beam expander set to its nominal position. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Substantially better. Looks very promising, doesn't it? Now these blocks are 25 millimeters tall. Each one of these burns was five seconds worth of 35 to 38 watts. This one was the burn straight out of the tube. This one was after we'd inserted the times two beam expander and this was 500 millimeters away. To compare like with like, I then put the times one beam expander in. This is the comparison straight out of the times one beam expander. Phenomenal difference. The only problem is this quality of beam is not maintained. I had it set to its nominal setting here and it looks pretty comparative to the beam itself. It seems to be exiting at times one, which is brilliant. When you compare it to this times two, which is rubbish. But when I move 500 millimeters away with its nominal setting, we get this result. As opposed to that result, which was rubbish, this one was just very, 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 very poor. I then changed the expander settings to plus one and got this result and minus one and minus two and got those results. Very little difference between them. The times one beam expander looks extremely good. The beam does not maintain its Gaussian distribution as we move further away from the expander. Now to close out this first series of tests, I've removed the times two and somewhere about here we should see the raw beam at 1.3 meters. One, two, three, four, five. That's absolutely abysmal, isn't it? Look, it's got a double shape on it as well. Now that's not unreasonable because unlike a glass tube machine, this tube is produced between two plates and it has to be rounded with some sort of lens mechanism before it exits the tube. You can see that it isn't very well rounded up, not at distance. It's still got its oval shape. There are two basic designs of beam expander. We've got this one here, which is the design that I used for my crude attempt. And there was a crossover focus point between the two lenses. And although I didn't use my lenses this way round, because of the spherical nature of our lens design, whether it's this way or the other way, we will always suffer with this problem here called spherical aberration. Now, as you can see, the rays that come in from the outer part of the lens are focusing at a different point to those that are coming in from the central part of the lens. Now, hang on. The whole idea of this Keplerian design is that we have a single focus point. If we don't have a single focus point, how can we pick up the focus point and, and change it when we get to the second lens? We start off with a nice Gaussian distribution here. We've completely destroyed the Gaussian distribution. If we take a sample across here, it is no longer that Gaussian distribution. It's rubbish. Yet we've still got the same amount of power in the beam, but it's no longer distributed in this perfect Gaussian manner. And that really is the fundamental problem. If we take that messy focus situation and apply it here, we've no longer got a Gaussian distribution to send out of lens number two. This looks a much more interesting situation, which is the way in which this times two beam combiner is designed. We've got a concave lens, which is going to distribute the rays differently. Now, the rays arriving on this concave lens are going to act completely differently to this situation here. We haven't got a crossover point of focus, but we've still got an expansion of the beam that arrives here and it's a spherical shape. So there will still be spherical aberration. The rays that arrive at this point will not necessarily arrive in a uniform manner. They certainly won't be as disrupted as this design, but my suspicion is that they're arriving here reasonably intact, but not sufficiently intact to be amplified through this lens system to make it parallel. 
As I mentioned earlier in this session, lens theory depends upon one critical factor, beam diameter. You tell me what the beam diameter is on a laser beam. The full width of half maximum describes roughly the 70% power part of the beam. And that's the problem with lens theory. Lens theory cannot grab hold of a fact about the laser beam to give us real control over what's going on. Okay, now one of my correspondents, Danny Miller, has suggested that I could improve the performance of this system here by messing around with the position of these two lenses relative to each other. Now he's found on his machine that he can get some great results by increasing this distance here. Now, if you think about it, there is a certain amount of logic to that because remember what I said here, the focus is not where you expect it to be. The focus is somewhere different. I can't imagine what's happening here. So there is a possibility that what Dan is suggesting is actually valid. Some of the language that he uses, he knows quite a bit about optics and lens theory. But as we found, lens theory doesn't necessarily apply to our laser beam. Now his suggestion is that we open up the distance between these two lenses. And he has found that he can get some excellent results by doing so. Now he's got a big machine and he tells me that he can control the beam diameter. My problem is, I don't care about the beam diameter. What I'm interested in is the integrity of the beam intensity as it goes around the machine. Right, a couple of days have passed because I've been involved with other things and that has given me time to think about that standard set of mode burns that we produced before we go forward and modify the times two if we can ever get it to work whether or not it would be transferable back to a glass tube machine. I'm currently working on the RF machine, which before I started, I didn't realize was the right thing to use for this sort of experiment. Let me try and explain. Here is a glass tube intensity profile. Now, when we run this tube at 10% power, here's the shape of the Gaussian distribution. When we push the power up to 70%, remember, the beam diameter does not change, but the intensity does. I've done all sorts of testing with lenses. And remember, when we change the power, or the speed, or the material, we get a change in the focal distance from the nominal focal distance specified by the manufacturer. So these two different powers, when they pass through a lens, they're going to produce two different focal ranges. And I said focal ranges because there isn't a focal point for this or this. There's probably a smaller focal range for this than there is for this, but they will still produce a focal range. The way an RF tube works is completely different to the way in which a glass tube works. We don't have any variable power in an RF beam. It's always got a constant current flowing through it. It appears to have change of power because you switch this beam on and off with a square wave PWM frequency. But whenever you switch the beam on, this is what it looks like. It's never any different. There's always constant fixed current running through the RF tube. You just switch the beam on and off, and this is what you get. The only reason you appear to be controlling the power of an RF beam is because of exposure time. You expose this fixed beam for very, very small increments of time. So for example, if this beam is on for 50% of the time and off for 50% of the time, it's equivalent to a 17 and a half watt beam. If we turn it on for 99% of the time and off for 1% of the time, 
it appears to be a 35 watt beam that's doing 35 watts worth of damage. Okay, well now, look, previously I've been using eight millimeter thick acrylic for my little test blocks, but I just managed to recently, um, when I visited my supplier and pulled around in their scrap bin, I managed to find some 20 millimeter thick acrylic. So I'm now making my test blocks from 20 millimeter acrylic. Okay. It's slow, I have to cut it at one millimeter a second with a four inch lens, but look, the results are pretty good, aren't they? Anyway, that aside, I can get in there with a fingernail and take this back lens out. Now I've made some little metal spacing rings to make sure I don't allow the lens to wobble. Now, here's my little spacer and it's got a little location ring inside it to make sure the lens stays central. It's a snug fit inside the thread there, so I'm gonna put that in first. Okay, so I've added about one and a half millimeters to the distance between those two lenses. That's approximately what Danny was suggesting. And then maybe we'll put some little spaces in. I've got some half mil spaces here, which we can put under the front lens to pull that forward. Create out a modified beam expander. Zero. One, two, three, four, five. Well, here we are at 500 millimeters away. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Well, that is a definite improvement over that one. Well, we've now added another millimeter. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. And yes, it's improving yet again. Four millimeter increase now. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. What can we say? Thank you, Danny. That's a dramatic improvement at 500 millimeters. Let's see what happens at 1.3 meters, which is the distance I've got to get to. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Now, not good at 1.3 meters, but better than the raw beam. Can I push it up a bit more? Just about at the limit of what's possible to squeeze into this beam expander. I've now got about four and a half millimeters of expander. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Now, if anything, it's a little bit worse. Perhaps I should take a little bit out. Now I've got about two and a half millimeters in there. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. That was no adjustment. That's five millimeter spacing, four millimeter spacing, and 3.5 millimeter spacing. So, Four is better than nothing, but it's still not brilliant. It's not what I'm looking for. This works pretty well out to about 500 mil. Let's see where it drops off, shall we? Well, here we are, 800 millimeters. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. I mean, if it was like that all around the machine, we'd be pretty damn pleased. That's with a three and a half millimeter spacing in it, I believe. Four millimeters roughly at one, two, three, four, five, six. Not a lot different. I would say three and a half millimeters is better. Right now, I think I'm probably down to about three millimeters now. Zero. One, two, three, four, five. So that's. 800 millimeters, which is pretty good. Here we are at a thousand millimeters. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Well, we're definitely losing it now. It's getting bigger. But that is a significant improvement. Thank you very much, Danny. So what we'll do, we'll go back and just check now what it's like at the beam itself. Zero, one, Two, three, four, five. It's 
So what I'll have to do now is to measure the distance between those lenses accurately so that I know what I've got. At the moment it's a bit of a guess at three millimetres more than normal. So let me go and measure that. And here's a quick summary of what we're trying to achieve. So we've got to the lens with a shape like that, which is absolutely fantastic. But now what we've got to do, we've got to traverse around the machine in X and Y, 500 by 300. And this is where we start losing our power. So even though we've managed to get as far as 500 millimetres, we're nowhere near solving the problem. Here's my original configuration. 36 millimetre across the lenses. Danny was suggesting we might add a couple of millimetres plus a little teeny weeny bit of tweaking to get maybe as far as two metres. Hasn't quite worked out that way, I'm afraid. Um, it may well be that the beam is nice and parallel, but as I specified at the beginning of this process, I'm not really interested in the beam itself. The beam diameter is unimportant to me. The thing that's most important to me is the intensity in the beam. I've got to keep that shape over 300 by 800 millimetres, the work area. If I can do that, then yeah, we've got a really great machine here. I had to add nearly six millimetres to the system to get that configuration at 500 millimetres. Behind the scenes I've been playing, fiddling and trying to see if I can improve the situation at 800 or 1000 millimetres. And look, I've got lots of tests here which I've been doing and none of them get me really much further than six, seven hundred millimetres and then they drop off really, really badly. We already know that lens theory is not going to help us with this because what we're interested in is the intensity in the beam, not the beam diameter. And so consequently, chuck the lenses in the air and said, right, how do they fall down? Because of the special sizes of these lenses in here, I haven't got much choice. I can either use the lens this way round or the other way round, this way round or the other way round. So I've got a few combinations that I have been trying as well as the standard configuration. Let's throw the standard configuration out and see what else we get with this combination of lenses. Is there something else that we can achieve? Well, I've got the lens set up now with this configuration here. It's roughly the same, plus six millimeters over and above what we had originally, but the lenses are configured differently. At the moment, they're configured like this. We're no longer really interested in what's happening at 500 millimetres. Well, that's our start point really, 500 millimetres. And then what we want to see is what goes on out to 1300 millimetres. That's our real working zone. So here's the new configuration at 500 millimetres. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Let's take that tank, same configuration and go out to 1000 millimetres. Two, Three, four, five, six. It's losing it, but it's still substantially better than anything else that I've had before at a thousand millimeters. So let's push it to 1300 and see what we finish up with. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. You see what I mean? It drops off really, really rapidly at 1300. Those are the best results that I've managed to get so far. I have been playing with the times one beam expander as well, but that's absolutely useless. 150, 200 millimeters with that one, and it just drops off something like this very badly. Final test, I've flipped the front lens of the beam expander over so that it has concave side outlets. Zero. One, two, three, four, five. At 1300 millimetres, that is an improvement over convex side outwards. It really doesn't matter what lens theory says. It's all a matter of what the lenses tell me. 
and the lenses tell me that the best way round for that lens is that way and the best way round for that lens is that way and it's totally the opposite way round to how this beam expander was supplied to me. It was supplied to me with 36.08 and I've finished up at 41.45 with the lenses the wrong way round. Go figure. The guys that designed this as a two times beam expander remember did it according to the rules of lens theory. Now it may produce a parallel beam we're not interested in the shape of the beam really we're interested in the intensity within the beam maintaining that integrity. We've made a significant improvement on what it was when it started off and I would like to see a mode burn from one of these big boy machines where they claim they've got uniform performance over the whole of the table. I wonder how uniform it really is and it may well be that the tube looks like that. Great for engraving absolutely no good for cutting. Next time we will do some cutting tests on this machine to see how the cutting varies across the table because I'm very confident that this machine will cut substantially better than it did before. Well thanks for your time and patience. Catch up with you next time. Bye!